thank you everyone for being here um, in Vermont and all the way on the West Coast. It's so nice to see all of you. I'm gonna share my screen so I can start this. So here's this, here's this book, Charlotte Bronte Before Jane Eyre. What I'm gonna do is talk about uh, how this book came about. I'm gonna do a short reading of uh, two pieces from it and then talk about how I made the book. It came out uh, last year in September. And so it's really nice to, to a year later be able to still talk about the this, this book. Um, it's amazing that this talk is set in Manchester, Vermont because there is a connection with Manchester, England um, right on the cover of this book. This scene of um, Charlotte beginning to write Jane Eyre uh, takes place uh, in Manchester in the UK. Uh, while she was visiting there um, for her, her father had some eye surgery and she had nothing to do and it was raining outside. So it was a good time to start a book. And um, so this book is a part of a series that is sponsored by the Center for Cartoon Studies, which is located in White River Junction. This is um, on the other side of the state from Burlington um, um, and is a two year graduate or certificate program in comic studies. And since this book has come out, I've begun to teach there in, um, I teach the second year thesis seminar where students um, focus on working on often graphic novels, but nonfiction work and short work. So it's, it's an extraordinary place to be a part of. Um, they do other stuff besides teach uh, like this series. Other ones in the series include a book about uh, Satchel Page by James Sturm. Um, and there's a book about Harriet Tubman that's coming out very soon that is absolutely beautiful. I've seen just a few pages of it. Um, they also put out a short comic about democracy recently, um, much needed, and about mental health. So, uh, how surprising. Um, so for context, the Brontes lived in this very small village in northern England, not far from Manchester, England. Um, and they, they were pretty isolated. They were used to living the way many of us are now without the benefit of the internet. Um, they, this, is, this and this are almost the last pages of the book. So this is where the, the story ends. Um, with the publication of Jane Eyre in 1847, um, many, maybe you know, um, that the, the Brontes went on to all die uh, of various diseases. But my book ends with on this high note of having uh, the publication of Jane Eyre. Um, but how did it get there? How did, how did Charlotte get to this point of publishing this book coming from this very tiny and isolated town? Um, that's, that's where the book begins. But first I drew this to, um, jog all of our memories about who wrote what. So this is based on a portrait by um, their brother, Branwell Bronte, Anne, who wrote these two books, and Emily's single book, Wuthering Heights. And Charlotte lived the longest to, and published four books. So if only they'd lived a little longer. Um, so here's page one. Instead of starting with, with Charlotte was born, I, I started the book in, uh, let me move this thing, um, in March, 1837, when Charlotte was 21, she was teaching at this school where she had been a pupil. Um, and just before this scene, she had written a letter to the, poet laureate of England, asking, sending her a few of her poems that she had been writing as she was writing almost all her life, asking advice about, about whether it's possible to make a living um, with literature, with writing, because she felt even at that age that teaching was hard and, 
It, it, that's true. I'm, I'm feeling it every day. And, and so um, wondering what, what other alternatives are there for, for her life or additions to her life. And unlike Jane Austen, marriage was to, in order to make an income was absolutely the furthest thing from her mind. Even though she had several proposals, she wasn't willing to, to um, sacrifice any kind of freedom of her time and will for financial security. So, but that was a preoccupation with almost all her life. So uh, back to 1837, she's at this school, here comes the postman. And now I'm gonna go into, I'm gonna read this and I've separated out the panels um, for, for dramatic effect. Panel one, Rowhead School. Post, thank you, sir. By the way, I'm not doing this in a Yorkshire accent because I just can't do it. Letter for you, Miss Bronte. Thank you. Are you well, miss? News from a sweetheart, maybe? No, not at all. Hmm. Well, don't let me keep you from reading it. I'll read it when I have a moment to myself. A substantive is an adjectival noun. Chomp, chomp, chomp. Time for bed, girls. Ah, one more story. Some girls can't help themselves. They just prattle all day long. It's one thing during recreation hour, but some continue even in class. They talk and talk and talk, and it's so hard to concentrate. Don't you find, Charlotte? <gasps> Yawn. Finally. You live in a visionary world. You who so ardently desire to be forever known. You evidently possess and in no inconsiderable degree, the faculty of verse. I am not depreciating it when I say that in these times it is not rare. Many volumes of poems are now published every year without attracting public attention. Whoever therefore is ambitious of distinction in this way ought to be prepared for disappointment. Literature cannot be the business of a woman's life. The more she is engaged in her proper duties, the less leisure she will have for it, even as an accomplishment and a recreation. To those duties you have not yet been called, and when you are, you will be less eager for celebrity. Write poetry for its own sake, not in a spirit of emulation and not with a view to celebrity. The less you aim for that, the more likely you will be to deserve and finally obtain it. Your true friend, Robert Southey. So, Here's the, the letter Charlotte received, age 21, that literature cannot be the business of a woman's life. And so from here, the rest of the book is Charlotte's struggle and achievement in the world of literature. And I know that these, now um, Jane Eyre is not a, usually a required book among high school students the way it was when I was in school. But I think it's still maybe more widely read and more well known than the poetry of Robert Southey. So that says something about, about what happened and um, to Charlotte's work. So I'm going to jump ahead to 1842 some years later. Now Charlotte, and, it, and, and she has not stopped thinking about other, other things she can do in life. So here she is crossing the English Channel to go to school in um, Brussels by, I think it was something, an overnight train ride from um, Northern England to crossing the channel, to um, riding in this coach um, to Belgium. 
And her and our, she's traveling with Emily and their father. And her idea is that she will she will gain more education and ultimately start her own school at the parsonage um, in Haworth. She even went as far after this episode to print up invitations to advertise the school, but it never got off the ground. Um, one reason is that Haworth is very isolated and um, the parsonage is right in front of a graveyard. So it was both, both isolated and gloomy. Um, I, I really enjoyed drawing these images, searching for um, uh, steamers at the, from the time, carriages, the sky I took from a Dutch painting. Um, and the words all come from Charlotte's book, The Professor, which also takes place in, uh, in Brussels. They went to Brussels rather than Paris because it was cheaper, which is funny. Um, so the next two pages are uh, arriving at this, uh, the school for girls. And they settle in. These two images are based on some of the very few photographs of this, this place, which is now destroyed. And so these were very valuable to me. Um, now, a new scene. This is Charlotte and her professor, Monsieur Eger, who um, had a, a great influence on her, her writing, and, you, and you'll see why. Bam! This is what I'm talking about. I'm trying to show you how to write, Miss Charlotte. You put in so many details. How do they contribute toward developing a subject? By creating a picture with words, I build a scene. I set a mood. You fill your composition with so many images that your reader is lost. Rewrite this according to my corrections. Remember, remorselessly sacrifice everything that does not contribute to clarity. Accentuate everything that sets the main idea in relief so that the impression be colorful and picturesque. It's sufficient that the rest be in its proper place, but in half tone. That's what gives to style as to painting, unity, perspective, and effect. What's this, tears? My dear Miss Charlotte, I tell you the truth to improve your writing. You would not have me give you platitudes and spare your feelings. Pause for a, a commentary here. I took, I think, all of this dialogue just about from actual comments that this professor made on Charlotte's um, uh, essays that she wrote in France. The, the Charlotte's and Emily's essays survived and were published later, uh, along with Monsieur Eger's um, um, notes. So that was another very useful uh, resource for this book. When I, I tried to use as many um, words from directly from Charlotte or other characters that I possibly could. So this was a very good source for this, um, re including this, read Harmony 14 of Lamartine, The Infinite, a poem. We will analyze it together from the point of view of details. Here, have a bonbon. That's also, uh, apparently he carried around um, bonbons and bribed students all the time. We are working together. I am your teacher, yes? Remember that your improvement is a collaboration and I have faith in your abilities. Thank you. Until next time, Mademoiselle Bronte. Till next time. How can you let him get to you like that? Tears for God's sake. How can you not be affected? And bonbons, are we little children he needs to bribe? He's the first one who has read my writing, taken an interest and showed me ways to improve. We're paying him to take an interest. Also, haven't Anne Branwell and I read your writing since we were little? Does that count for nothing? You must have written a thousand pages before we came here. Don't you think you know what you're doing? Uh, pause for another comment. Charlotte did write about a thousand pages that is more pages altogether than all of her novels combined before she wrote any of the, her no the novels that she's known for. She um, 
and her siblings wrote a fantasy story set in a, set in the world of Glass Town or Angria. And there's a another Bronte graphic novel that came out this year um, by Isabella Greenberg that's that is set in that world. So it was a big year for Brontes. Um, this is the first time I've been asked to craft my compositions. Always before I've written whatever comes into my head, one scene after another, as vividly as I imagined them. But he sees how I can learn to control my imaginings to achieve greater power of expression. I just hope my next essay pleases him. Pleases him? It seems a far more profitable goal to please yourself. With Monsieur Eger, it's the same thing. So I, this scene um, between the sisters I, I is kind of springs from one of the Bronte critics saying that Charlotte's work really changed after Hege commented on it and after working with him and Emily's work did not change at all. She, she had, was very single-minded in her poetry and in her writing and she also refused to make friends with people and refused to change her clothes with fashion. She just, she just wore um, unfashionable, which is hard to express here. I'm, they're sort of in the same outfit, but, um, and Charlotte was very wanting to please her teacher and her aunt to make friends with people, but at the same time trying to, to uh, express herself, which I really related to. And I also felt like Monsieur Eger's comments uh, spoke directly to me in creating this work and, and trying to figure out what, was the, what are the most important things to express in this story. And so now I'm gonna to shift to making of. And so first off, I read a lot of books. By the way, you can see here, Charlotte Bronte, Tales of Angria, and the Brontes, Tales of Glass Town, Angria, and Gondol. These are the books that are collections of um, Charlotte's early stories about this fictional world, which I actually, I, I, they're not, they're not novels, but they're, they're very fun to read. Um, the next stage, because this is a big story and actually I don't, I didn't have a photo of the, the largest book I used, but, but finding a way to compress this, this story into 90 pages, which was the page limit of the series and the publisher was, was a big challenge. So I wrote, I wrote out very rough scenes on, on three by five or index cards. This was an idea from James Sturm um, and very useful because it replicates a page of a book um, here. Uh, and I, I tried to keep notes like what this fiery heart page 68. I don't know if I used these. James then said, hey, write out a school style S like um, outline. So here you see 1837 Rowhead School, scene one. That's the scene you just saw at the beginning of this talk. Um, and you can tell my printer was running out of power. So I had to write in every other line. It's kind of embarrassing. But um, another thing that, uh, that in order to keep all these events straight, I wrote this timeline of what happened in every year as it went on. And more importantly, um, uh, the the Bronte children, Charlotte, Branwell, Emily, Anne, in each year, how old they were, so that when they were children, I would know how, you know, what they what they should look like, because there's there's scenes in this book that take place when they're really little. This also shows you that um, there were two older sisters, Mariah and Elizabeth, who died at age 11 and age 10, as well as their mother. So the, these, these children were, were uh, raised in the shadow of grief and death of, all throughout their lives. On this, uh, also on the side, which is a little bit cut off, I put in the Bronte dogs. Here's Grasper. He came he came on the scene in 1833 
And uh, there are two other dogs that appear in most, I tried to put a dog in every scene that I could and because they were very important in especially Emily's life. Uh, next, well, another thing to help is drawing a plan of the downstairs of the house. The dining room is where they did all their writing. So here's the sofa, the fireplace, bookcases, windows, because I felt like in sta staging these scenes in my head, I needed to know what angle I was looking at and what they would see out the window. They, the answer is they would see the graveyard out the window and the moors um, is in this direction. I was also researching printers here. <laughs> um, so here's page one as a thumbnail. That was my next stage to, to take this. Uh, this is another idea straight from James Sturm is to make a template of, so I could, I could make four tiers or three tiers of, and so I wouldn't have to measure out panels every time, but could just use these guidelines to pace the scenes. So, um, you know, figuring out an establishing shot, a, a, um, and how the conversations would go. Um, then I, I had a, a, a break from the project to go to a residency in France, which was amazing in the, in the time when that was still possible. Um, and so, just before that, I went from, I flew from Paris to Manchester, UK, took two trains and what's called the Bronte bus over the moors. And they each have a name. I rode there on Emily and I came back on Charlotte and um, stayed in a um, bed and breakfast just long enough to be able to visit their house, take, take a lot of pictures of the inside, this dining room with the, the um, to see where Charlotte and Emily wrote Charlotte's desk, her glasses, her, her um, ink bottle, her fire extinguisher. No, that wasn't there back then. But it was, it was, it made a huge difference to be able to be in the house where she lived. And even more so to walk the moors. Um, so there's me at Weathering Heights, so called. It was a two hour walk up from their village. Uh, and and to really feel the 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 what it was like to to walk in that landscape made made it just I think it added a lot to my experience of making the book. Okay, back to work. Um, so here again is the first page, just to remind you, the what it looks like finished. Um, and here again is my thumbnail of the first page. So my first draft sketch of that page. Um, and then this, which doesn't look that much different is my penciled version. So I don't know if I can make this go back. Yeah, so the difference is subtle. Um, this one is eight and a half by 11. This one is 11 by 14. And it was at this stage that I wanted to make sure I had all the details correct, like measure out all these windows, like really figure out how to draw a horse, get the right hat on everybody and their hairstyles. <laughs> and then, um, so this, this stage involved a lot of, of visual research. So here's three images of Charlotte. These two, she drew herself. This one's from a, um, an, a letter from her to a friend of hers, and it's a self-portrait saying goodbye. She's waving from across the ocean. Um, this one is, is, it doesn't, it's not, it's drawn by Charlotte, but it's not labeled as a self-portrait, but it, it looks very much like this professional portrait that was done in London after her book was published. So this is where my Charlotte comes from, these, these images. Um, this is also the time when I needed to know what a proper um, postman looked like in, in the 1830s. I originally drew a kind of squashy hat on this guy, but um, the press without, uh, unbeknownst to me, thank God, because I would have been nervous, um, sent my thumbnail draft to 
the top uh, Bronte scholar named Juliet Barker, who wrote a brick sized biography of the Brontes. Um, and she sent me back 12 pages of notes, including this is what a postman's hat looks like. Um, so that was both very useful, um, slightly devastating, but for the most part, she was very happy with what I had done and she liked my jokes and it was very gratifying and, and um, really a treat to be able to have a, have a scholar like that comment and help the book become stronger. So this bonnet comes from um, the documentary To Walk Invisible, which is a BBC um, uh, production about the Bronte sisters. And that helped very much with um, uh, also costumes. Um, and luckily it doesn't cover exactly the same as my book. So that, that like, oh, good, I'm not doing the same thing as, as they are. And finally, on this page, this is Charlotte's drawing of her school. Writ in this, this is written by her father, by my daughter, Charlotte Bronte. Um, so she, she drew this in um, while she was at the school, and this is what it looks like today. Which, and it's still a school, it's a different school, but um, it's amazing that, that there it exists. So I wanted to put as many like concrete details like this as I could. And then the next stage was to draw this yet another time in a final form. Um, and many cartoonists at this stage turned to ink, but I wanted to keep drawing in pencil, both for the fact that I could get a greater gradient in or, or just more subtle tone in my drawing than if I had used ink and cross hatching. It was a, I'd never done this before. And it was sort of a, I just had it in my head that this is what I wanted to do. So, so I did it. Um, and it's not, not, and then yet another stage in this was I printed out, I drew the entire book all again in pencil like this. Um, as one cartoonist friend called it, penciling, uh, inking in pencil. So I scanned these pages, 90 of them like this, and then printed them out. And then on a, using a light table and watercolor paper, I made ink washes for every page that look like this. So like not very much. And then using Photoshop, I put the two together in layers and, and a panel border template over the top of that. So why do this crazy many step system? This was so I could, I could manage the, the um, dark and light levels of the pencil drawing and um, not have the pencil drawing interfere with the ink wash. And I, I could have drawn this all on the same on the same piece of paper, but this way I, I think I had more control and um, and freedom in a way. I got this technique from Alison Bechtel. She she this is how she works and um, I appreciated her describing her working method and and so used it. Um, here's another page that you've seen broken down into panels. So this, these are my, um, these are images of Emily Bronte, also painted by their brother Branwell. And here's Charlotte's dress from the um, Haworth Bronte Museum. Uh, oh yes, so here are a few other of the very rare images of um, the school in Belgium. So I didn't know what it looked like inside. There's no images of that. I just imagined it here. And, oh, um, lots of image research um, for, for sailing ships, for what their, the house looked like, for the inside of this dining room. I mean, yeah, they, they called it a dining room because they, this is the table where they all wrote and there's the dogs. 
the, the dog collars are actually in the museum at, in Haworth, which is amazing. They're metal too. This sofa later is later where Emily died. But the great thing about ending the book with Jane Eyre publishing is, is that none of them had to die in my book. So when I was working on this for a year and a half of my life, um, Charlotte became a kind of character who came with me everywhere, especially to yoga, because that's when you know you, your, your mind kind of lets go. So I easily imagined her next to me at yoga, um, but she wouldn't really understand what it was because um, they didn't have that in her lifetime. So I have to explain that it helps to alleviate the anxiety of unrecognized genius. This Charlotte isn't famous yet. Let's see, um, on occasion, Charlotte was overtaken by visions of her own characters. Here's Zamorna, who is a main character from Charlotte's um, fantasy writing. I just came to adjust your warrior too. Adjust me too. I know, I'll write a story about a heroine who is just as small, plain, and insignificant as I am, and an ugly hero too. That's Mr. Rochester. Zamorna's head just imploded because that was one of her the major shifts in Charlotte's work is to make characters who are not as ideal and more real. But I, but I thought, as I'm being haunted by Charlotte, she was haunted by the characters she created. I, I also wrote this comic for The New Yorker, 19th century novels with better birth control, because I was, began to think about how, how Jane Eyre, among many other 19th century novels, are, are pretty <laughs> circumscribed by uh, women's uh, fertility and lack of availability. And so instead of, of running away, um, Jane could have said, do you think because I'm poor, obscure, plain and little that I don't also have an IUD? That villa in France sounds very nice actually. And in Wuthering Heights, Heathcliff, you big goof. How could I be dead from childbirth when I was never pregnant? We can still haunt the moors though, just cause it's fun. And the tenant of Wildfeld Hall. My heart was stolen by one unworthy of its possession, but no worries, I moved on and saved so much on rent of Wildfell Hall. I, I'm, I'm sad to do this to these great works that I really love, but I thought I could solve them all. This, comes from a series also for The New Yorker that I drew imagining um, books of, uh, about parenting um, from different time periods. So this is for the Victorian, how you and your Victorian child can stay fashionably sedated until this repressive, repressive era is over. This, this is kind of like now actually. Uh, another Another um, Bronte sisters come to life was I did the annual appeal comic last year for the Center for Cartoon Studies, um, where the Bronte sisters come to study in White River Junction. Instead of novel writing, they're studying comics now. This is a direct, this scene is parodying my own scene from a book where Charlotte describes herself as a cow coming to new grass. But I thought that's also quite, quite on for Vermont, um, which has so many cows. And the, the Bronte sisters would have loved the Schultz Library with its best Victorian comics and pirate ships. And this is, this is the end with, um, I'm ending back in Manchester where Charlotte is just beginning to write um, Jane Eyre. She's got a stack of blank paper and a rainy day outside and nothing else to do but write. And that's all. And I'm, I'm very happy to answer any questions and or hear any comments. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Glynis. That yeah. was marvelous. We do have a couple, a few questions here for you. Great. Um, I will start with from Rumi, who asks, uh, who comments that your thumbnails look beautiful. Do oh, you, Rumi, thank you so much. And do you draw the same page several times before you get it right? Or do you go straight from the index cards to thumbnails? Oof, that's a good one. I think, uh, yes, I do. I do feel like I've um, draw the same page. Well, with thumbnails, yes, I'm drawing them several times. The book that I am working on now, I keep drawing them over and over. And even in the penciling stage, I'm drawing them again and again. So um, yes, I definitely drew, draw these more than once. And actually the, the pile I have of, of thumbnails that I rejected is almost higher than the book. I mean, there's, there's many pages that either didn't make the cut because they didn't go, they didn't um, align with the theme as they should have or, or didn't work in some way. So um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a long process. We have another question. Um... And it, it is, are the marks, the little, uh, little marks that you make um, in the novel, are those direct quotes marks? Uh, those were um, to indicate that that conversation was in French. So I, I, I debated using uh, quotation marks around every direct quote. Um, but in the end, I didn't because often I used as many words as a direct quote as I could and then you know, had to make it fit in the dialogue. And, and so also, man, they're, they're, uh, they're very wordy in the 19th century. So I, I had to cut a lot, which I felt awful doing. Cause like, who am I to cut the work of, of, of Charlotte Bronte? But I, I had to, in order to make it fit on a, you know, within, within the page limit. And so that there would never be like, more than four lines of text in one place. Cause I thought that's just too much. People don't want, if you're reading a comic, you want to have the text and the, the imagery balanced very carefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, did you also draw the words? Uh, the, the first page I hand lettered it and the rest is a font based on my handwriting. So some of each. Oh. I, I don't love that font. I, it's, <laughs> but, but actually it came in handy because I could edit it like, like in, um, on the computer rather than having to re hand letter something when there were changes. So that's sort of your own creation, your own typeface. It's yes, it is. I didn't make it. Um, my, my studio mate in France's ex-boyfriend made it. <laughs> so it's I, I it works very well I think for for the next th projects I do I would like to to make alternate letters so it doesn't look as mechanical as it does to me now we have another comment from Catherine the eyebrows the eyebrow expressions is there some kind of cartoonist's <laughs> dictionary of eyebrow details <laughs> Hi, Catherine. Thanks for coming. Um, that is such a good question. I think um, it reminds me of the cartoonist Ivan Brunetti in his book, Cartooning, has a whole page of oh, one of the he has an exercise where you just draw an entire page of, of um, circles for faces and then you fill in the eyebrows for everyone trying to make different expressions. And I, I feel like when I'm drawing, I make these expressions. So I'm like glowering and, and, um, and looking askance all, all just, just so I can feel it in, you know, in my own face as I draw it. But yeah, I, eyebrows are one of the best things ever for expression. Uh, Betsy asks what kind of paper you use. Well, um, for the thumbnails, I use uh, just printer paper, and then I use uh, um, Strathmore um, Smooth Bristol for for drawing, and it, 
that that just happens to work um, the best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what did you learn about the Brontes during this process that surprised you, if anything? Oh, uh, I, I think it surprised me how much I, I really got to like them. I mean, when, when I agreed to do this project, James asked me, I really, I, I had, my mom actually read me Wuthering Heights when I was maybe 13 and oh, it scared me. Um, and I, and so I really didn't know, I, I knew that I would like the, this project. I, I, I chose the Brontes out of a list. So I came into it not being, not knowing a lot at all. And I think um, I was surprised at how, how much I, I felt an affinity with Charlotte and also their, their fantasy world was really astounding and, um, and how much I enjoyed really delving into that world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Laurel who says that um, uh, I teach the Bronte's work works to my AP literature students. Where can I order a copy of this book? I would love to share it with them. And Ooh. I'll go out on a limb and, and give a shout out to our local bookstore, Northshire, Northshire um, bookstore, but I'm sure that um, any independent bookstore could pick up a cup, pick up a copy for you, or do you have um, some thoughts on that, Glennis? Well, yeah, I, th I, I just echo exactly that. And Laurel, I'm so glad to hear you. You're teaching this work. Um, that's it makes me so happy. And I would say yes, order through your local whatever whatever bookstore is local and closest to you. Um, yeah, I think that's the best call. And uh, Melange says the backgrounds here are so washed and impressionistic and your people are cartoonish in appearance, appropriately so, of course. How do the aesthetic process of making these images feel for you in comparison to your work in archeological illustration where precision and realism are so much the priorities? Wow, that is a, such a good question and I very consciously made the characters and their faces simple and made the backgrounds as, um, as well uh, accurate as possible. While I really, I wanted also the, the skies in this, whenever there was a sky, I wanted to really make the, the sky full of uh, energy and, and I think um, background in archeology span where pr precision is so Im important, that has, that has really helped be able to think about research in, in, um, in a way that where, I, where um, I, I want to make things as accurate as possible. And it's amazing com to work on a subject from the 19th century, as opposed to um, say the Bronze Age, which is what I'm working on now, where you can know so much. I mean, the, these objects are still existing and the places are still here. So that helped a lot. But um, to making the characters being very simple, uh, that, that I, I relate that to um, Scott McCloud's theory which I don't know if this is true or not, where um, the more simple characters are drawn, the more you can relate to them. And he gives the example of Charlie Brown or think of Calvin and Hobbes, they're drawn very simply. Um, while, especially in Calvin and Hobbes, they really puts a lot of energy into the backgrounds. And so I followed in that, in that um, um, path, because of wanting um, to you know, have people relate to the characters, but also there's, they're, the more simple they're drawn, they're, um, it, puts the, it puts the attention to their environment. And I, I think realistic faces are, are sometimes a, a little bit off-putting. Um, 
uh, and it also takes longer. I mean, imagine if you have to draw this character in 90 pages, she's probably on every page times how, like maybe six. <laughs> I think I want to, I want to make it um, readable quickly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Were you inspired to learn more about Charlotte after the time she wrote Jane Eyre? Oh yeah, I read, I definitely read her biography to the very end. And this was really, um, James Sturm really helped as an editor in this book, wanting to shape the story very specifically from um, the idea of, of, okay, what, what were the challenges she faced? How did she accomplish them? And then let's get it to the point of, and the rest is history, and then end it there. Because we know, or you can know that, that e very easily find out that they, that they all died. I mean, in that same year that Charlotte published Jane Eyre, or shortly in the, in the year or two afterwards, Branwell, then Emily, and then Anne all died. And so, and then Charlotte lived for another 10 years and then she died young. So it's a very sad story. And, and in order to, to really focus on Charlotte's achievements, the, the, the ending point of the publication of Jane Eyre was the right thing to do. But I definitely read all of her, of the rest of Charlotte's existence um, is, is, it's, it's equally as fascinating. Wow. But I'm very glad not to have to draw that. Cause that yeah. <laughs> well, uh, William says, I had never heard that the Bronte sisters had, had a shared fantasy kingdom and were sometimes haunted by the characters. The dark side of that would be the Parker Hume murder case. That's the case depicted in Peter Jackson's film, Heavenly Creatures. Did you see Ooh. dark side to their story? Oh, that's that's a good question. Um, hmm. Well, I guess there the the dark side is provided by them all them dying. Uh, I mean, they they've are they already lived in a in a precarious world where their two sisters and mother died. I don't see them. Um, I mean, I think actually the, the writer Elizabeth Gaskell wrote a, uh, a Charlotte's first biography and, and she, she um, created some myths about the Brontes that went on to kind of haunt Charlotte. Um, that is, they were very wild. They were, they were underfed by their very um, rigorous father, which I don't think were quite true. Um, another, another, I mean, I think especially Emily's work is full of ghosts and, and Charlotte's, of course, there's the mad woman in the attic, uh, in Jane Eyre. Um, so I think, I think their work is riddled with dark sides <laughs> mm -hmm. and, um, I, I, yeah, I had another thought, but I, 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 yeah, I've lost it for the moment. I, I'm sh I, it might come back. Well, um, we have time for just a, a couple more questions. Um, well, I'll, we have a comment and a question. Uh, yeah. One is here is uh, from Katrina that it's fascinating about how you've had to distill the text. And I love the way that you've researched other works for conversation. Your pencil work is gorgeous. And I'm amazed by her own drawing of the school. You are all so good. And, and hello from Walla Walla. Hi, Katrina. Thanks for coming. Thanks for writing. That's so nice. And we'll wrap it up with just final two questions. One is from the uh, the beginning to from the concept to the end of the of the publication date. How how long is your process of completing this this work? Um, that's a that's a very good question. This I'm it. Uh, I think it was about. I think I, I would worked on this for about a year and a half and then I turned it in last January and it was published in September. So, mm -hmm. so there was a time when I was completely done but waiting for publication and that's when they, they sent it out to reviewers. And mm -hmm. um, so, so 
that was that was relatively quick I'm finding compared to the next books that I'm working on. Well, we, have, we, we wanna hear about that. <laughs> but one last question, um, did Charlotte write in those 10 years after her family died and specifically, did she suffer from depression? Do we know? Hi, Auntie. Thanks for coming. Um, I think she, she, there's a very, there's a, I think she must have. There's some, some, a servant described her as walking around the dining room table late into the night after her sisters had died uh, because as she used to do that with them. And then she, she was, she was all alone. Um, I think she really did. Oh, I, I just remembered about the, another dark side question. Um, she, um, she made sure that Anne and, and Emily's books were published after they, I mean, they published when they were still alive, um, but they went into, they, they've never been out of print. So they were reprinted after they um, died. But Charlotte wrote a a very um, kind of kind of apologetic introduction to, to a an edition of Weathering Heights that that was a response to criticism of her of her sister's wildness, and I suspect that Charlotte burned Emily's um, writing. She she was working on a book, and I think and there's no trace of it now, and and so I think. Charlotte was very aware that that other people were critical of Emily's kind of radical views about religion and love that she thought shouldn't be in the world. So I wish I wish she hadn't taken those criticisms into account and let her sister's work survive. Mm. Um, but I no doubt she she was very she had a very hard time. And then she got married. So when Charlotte died, she died of a, of a pregnancy that, that turned on her. Um, I can't remember the word for that, but she, it was like her immune system was fighting her pregnancy. Oh. So that's even worse. <laughs> Sorry to say. Well, I hate to end on that somber note, but I'd like to uh, turn our attention to uh, what you're working on now. What's okay. what projects are you doing? So I'm, I'm working on two projects and um, one of them, I have a couple of images from actually. Um, this will go ahead. Ooh, look at this. This is cheerful. Um, I'm working on a book set in um, uh, the, uh, the late Bronze Age, so like 1600 BC uh, in Greece, Cyprus, Egypt, um, and yeah, Sant Santorini, Crete, and Egypt, and this is in Egypt, and it's a it's a completely different story, but relies a lot on um, on archaeology. Here's here's two of the characters. It's a book for younger kids, and so that's that's something very different. Uh, nobody dies. I mean, knock on wood. The other project I'm working on, I can, I'm gonna stop this share, um, is a, um, a graphic version of this book called 1177 BC, the end of the year civilization collapsed. It, it's over and over, it, it might be, um, it should say 2020, but so, um, <laughs> So those are my two projects. It's back to the world of archaeology. That's marvelous. So when might we see these finished works? Oof, I think um, 11, this, this one I, will come out first, um, even though I've done more work on the other one, because I'm, um, I have a pressing contract. That one, I think, is scheduled to be published in 2023. So I have my work cut out for me. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That was just marvelous. Thank you. I th think we've run out of time. Um, I'm, I'm, I think we've, ca we've captured all the questions. Um, if I missed anyone, I'm sorry, but I don't think so. Uh, it's just been really terrific spending our evening together with you, Glennis, and 
I'll remind everyone who lives in the Manchester, Vermont community, they can check out the book from the library. We can't, we have it on order. We can't wait to get it in. And um, we will look for more of your work in the future. And well, thank you all so much for coming. And um, I'm, I'm very, it's, it's so nice to receive so many really um, um, interesting, thought provoking questions and so nice to see all of your names and faces and thank you so much.